the opportunity to partner with OIC of America and Unite Here Local 274 um, and having this deeper conversation around the issue of poverty in the city of Philadelphia. Philadelphia is the poorest big city in America. Almost 30% of our people live in, under poverty level and 40% of our children go to bed hungry every single night. It is a travesty uh, with 1.6 million people in this city that we struggle so deeply with the issues of poverty um, and we struggle so deeply uh, being a world-class city and uh, um, that we are not doing better in taking care of our communities, our businesses aren't doing better in taking care of their workers um, in, in whole. We have many challenges that face us, uh, but the one challenge that we face that seems to be common to us all is the economic impact of what happens in our city. And so we're here today uh, because we want to hear from the real experts in the city of Philadelphia. Um, and they don't have PhDs, and they don't necessarily have master's degrees or bachelor's degrees, but they're the people that live in the rural homes in North Philly and South Philly and West Philly who work jobs every single day, sometimes you know, doing the best they can to make it, who are able to speak truth to us and truth to those that will listen to the things that we're going to talk about in the days to come about how we fix our city. This is about Philly solutions for Philly problems. Um, and we believe that the best policy experts and the best experts to help us get out of this, this struggle are not those that sit in the ivory towers, but those that sit on the stoops and the porches um, and hang out in Philadelphia, the every, everyday people for whom this city is home uh, and for whom we care deeply about the success of this place. So we thank you all for coming and giving of your time, sharing your stories, and most of all, sharing your expertise about what it is to live and be in the city of Philadelphia. God bless you. My name is Pamela Johnson. I live in North Philly. I was born and raised. I live in one of the worst neighborhoods, but I managed to survive. I work at the Four Points by Sheraton for 18 years. I have five children and 13 grandchildren. All my children graduated from high school and work. I'm very proud of them. I started at this job in August of 1997. It wasn't unionized. They was giving us 17 to 18 rooms to clean a deck. The wages was crazy. We was making 6.45 an hour, and out of the 6.45 an hour, I was paying $182 a month for medical for me and my children. And they on, and they and they were only giving us a dime to a nickel raise a year. It was really a hard struggle to make ends meet. I needed medical for me and my children, and I had to pay bills. I was robbing Peter to pay Paul. I needed insurance, and so did my kids. And this was before they passed CHIP. It was a struggle be between trying to maintain a household and going to work and dealing with the BS that, that they was given, laying down on the job. We were doing 18 rooms, which was too much to do in a day. Sometimes they would switch our schedules around at the last minute, and there was nothing we could do about it. It affected our home lives a lot. We should, we should get paid for what we're worth as far as the job we do. Selling drugs on the corner is not an answer. Welfare is not an answer. We need something in our community that's going to help these people, help the families to get better jobs, better education, so they can take care of their, their families. Thank you. So currently, at this time, I've been a single parent since 2001. I've been a single parent. My son is now 20 years old in junior college. In 2013, I lost my full-time job. It wasn't the job I I lost a full-time job. And at that time, I was like, my that beginning of that week, my son had told me, Dad, I got accepted to Robert Morris University. This is where I want to go. The end of that week, I lost my job. And I'm like, oh, gosh. You know, how am I going to help get him to school? And I wasn't even thinking about, I had always been doing part-time working through a union job. So I, since then, I've been able to fall back on my union job. And I'm still able to pay for his education, taking care of my mortgage, car notes, whatever I have to pay, I'm paying it. But I have to work. I think I got... Six or seven W-2s this year, I'm not sure. I, sometimes I don't even rush to file it because I get charged by each W-2 I turn in, I get, my rate goes up for working more jobs. So um, 
How, how many jobs are you working? Six or seven. They're all part time with the union, different jobs where I can get them. I'm a single parent. I wanted to make, I made a commitment to make my son go to college, and I wanted to honor that commitment to him. You know, I don't pay the full tuition, but I pay over half of it each year. Banquet server, I was and a bartender, Radisson Warwick, and a bartender suite attendant at Lincoln Financial Field. Uh, at Lincoln Financial Field, out of approximately 150 suite attendants, there are five, including myself, that are African American. <clears throat> and the other four, they don't speak up to them because I guess they're scared of their job. I guess me because I'm actually the suite attendant for the owner of the Eagles in this spot. So I know that they can't get rid of me as long as I do my job. The owner likes me. So I'm fortunate and blessed with that position. But um, we also have all the dishwashers. I think we have one, one Caucasian dishwasher, the rest are African American. So you know, it's front of the house, back of the house, you can see the difference. Uh, a lot of the other, a lot of the co-workers that are in the lower positions at the stadium don't think that they can get into these positions like a sweet attendant. Sweet attendants and bartenders probably make the most money at the stadiums. A lot of us don't think that they're able to get in those positions. And I was talking with someone this week about one of the reasons why people don't think or, or, or don't even qualify for these positions. Probably because in society right now, just in this world, most, how many, there are very few African American restaurant owners compared to white restaurant owners. So therefore, we don't have that opportunity when we're growing up. My, my uncle owns a restaurant, my friends, parents own, you know, to, gr to grow up in that business and learn it. Fortunately, I came from a family that owned taverns, so I was involved in the tavern for 18 years. So I, you know, that gave me a, a foot, a foothold. So that's why we're looking towards working with OIC, hopefully on a program, to do something to, you know, get some training for African Americans into these positions because I know a lot of African Americans down the stadium that want to get into sweet attendance positions they don't have any type of experience, which, and that's the company first thing, oh, you have no experience. It's like Dominique said, they always want to say no experience. No experience to do this and that. And I understand the company's point, but if we get a program where we can train people to get out there and do these things, these positions, it's an opportunity, a better opportunity. And trust me, without this job, I, I don't know what I would have done with my son. I would have felt very sad having to tell him. You know, when I talk about poverty, you know, I remember not having some food on my plate. You understand? But sometimes when I couldn't eat, you understand? So that really touches my heart. You know, even today, I don't even like going to the supermarket sometimes. Because you can walk in a supermarket aisle and see all this abundance of food wow. everywhere. And we, we sitting here living in the United States yeah. and people are on the street starving. Yeah, how about that? I just had one of my coworkers tell me today, you know, he drives to work every day. And, he, and, and in the last few years, he would see a few homeless people. But now he's seeing whole families on the street. Mm. You know, and it's, and it's sad. It's just sad. This city, you know, this city right now, it's a lot of money coming to this city. You understand? If you just look around, you see all the buildings going up, everybody migrating to Center City. You know, they building this, they building that, condominiums are going up. But yet, people are starving. People are on the streets. You understand? You understand? And, and, and I we have a summit every week. You understand what I'm saying? Because the only way to solve this problem is People get out there, let their voices be heard, and let everybody know that this stuff is going on. It's, it's real. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. saying? Too, many, too many times, like a lot of politicians and stuff, they try to hide. You know what I'm saying? Because they get in their cars, you know, go out to the suburbs or work to their beautiful homes and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? And I raised two daughters. You know what I'm saying? And I, and I wanted to make sure they had the greatest opportunities on huh? at least come up better than I did. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying? So, The people in high school actually felt, actually thought they could come out from school and get a decent job. They would pay more attention. They wouldn't be messing around. They have a brighter outlook on just brighter outlook on life instead of just reacting without consequences. A lot of people think I'm gonna wind up like my uncle, in jail, dead, on drugs, doing something like leaving behind four kids, four different women, and no one to take care of them. People feel like this. They, people feel like there's no need to learn anything because there's no opportunities anyway. In the hospitality industry, it's a hot industry right now. There's all, they're always talking about you could be a chef, you could be a manager, come to our school. But the real jobs I see in hospitality are the cooks, the bellhops, the housekeepers, the people behind the scene who can have decent jobs, vacations, benefits. <coughs> They should be productive members of society. We're not, we're not asking to be millionaires. 
But we're looking at what we, what we are asking for is to be able to patronize the places that we work for. And I used to ask a lot of questions about some of the things that was going on at my job, you know. Whenever we had morning meetings and stuff like that, you know, they was always changing, trying, trying to change things on us. And I would ask questions and, you know, they started labeling me a troublemaker, right? Because I asked questions. I just want to know what's going on around me. You know, I was hired to do one thing and that's what I came here to do. You know, but so I wasn't getting, I was never getting any type of satisfactory answers to my questions. You know, so I was very frustrated. And what could I do but take that frustration home with me, right? Because you can't take the frustration out on the people that's actually frustrating you, which is your bosses, you know? So you take it out on the people nearest to you, which is your family, you know? And there were times when I would come home from work and I'd be tired, I'd be hurting, you know, because I'm a housekeeper, you know, I do rooms. And believe me, my back be hurting, my knees be hurting, now it's my darn hips. You know what I'm saying? I mean, when will it stop, right? So, but also I was very frustrated, you know? And my grandkids, I have three daughters and I have eight grandchildren. And when I would come home, you know, if they're there, like at that time, back then, they were still living with me. So when I would come home, the first thing I'd see when I walk in my door is my grandchildren. And they would run up to me, mama, 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 and my children trying to ask me questions. I don't hear neither one of them. All I see is that dark piece of paper on the floor. All I see is that fork in the sink. And I'm just snapping on everybody around me. When in actuality, I wasn't mad about any of that. You know, it was just a piece of paper. You know, I was already mad before I came in that door. You know, and I had nobody else to take it out on but them. They were the ones that I took my frustrations out on. And it wasn't fair. It wasn't fair to my children. It wasn't fair to my grandchildren. You know, and it definitely wasn't fair to me, the way that I felt when I came home, because I shouldn't have to come home feeling that way. You know, in America. And everyone should treat people the way they want to be treated. And with respect, dignity, I feel as though this city could be the city with the lowest incarceration rate and the lowest immortality, infant mortality rate instead of the highest. You know what I'm saying? I believe in Philly, and I love my city, it's my home, but I know it can be better, I know it can be greater than what it is right, at, right now. You know, that's why I volunteer my time. What I feel is people act out of desperation. They don't think that anything's on the horizon. They don't see any future for themselves. No, no hope. No hope, exactly. If people see that there is a, a, a if they, people see that there's hope to find a decent job, a career, something to look forward to. Like I said, they wouldn't act out, out of impulse. They they think about consequences to their actions. For me, my story is is that I started out working as a housekeeper. Like in 1988, I was working in Paoli, and what happened was I got injured off the job, and so. I was out of work for like five years. So after, I, when I went back out into the workforce, I was out there and I'm searching really hard trying to find me a job. So I put an application on City Line Avenue at the, Hampton, at the Hilton. Unfortunately, they called me back because I had no idea that I was gonna be working for $7.50. And then once I got in there, I found out how you know, hard I had to work for it. But that wasn't the worst of it. We had a housekeeping manager there, and she was really horrible. She was this little white lady, and it was like majority of the people that worked in the back of the house were black. So she used to always go up to people, and she's in their face, and she's like, you're stupid, you're dumb, you know what I mean? Or you're going to do this, or you got to do that. She was just so disrespectful. Everybody she talked to, she talked to in such a nasty way. And I used to just look at her, because people wouldn't, like, they wouldn't speak up for themselves. They would just, like, take it. And I used to just look at her and be like, oh my God, I hope she never does that to me. Because I know I'm not gonna take it. It's not gonna work for me. So what happened was, it was like, okay, one day I was, I was off work and she was trying to call me in to work on my off day. So when she called me, I didn't pick up the phone. So what she did was use my mother's 
phone number, which is an emergency contact number, and got my sister on the phone. And so she's asking my sister, well, where is Vanessa? Do you know where she is? My sister's like, no, she doesn't live here. Who is this? She's like, this is her boss. I need her here right now. I want her to come into work. So my sister said, well, did you call her? Was she supposed to work? She said, no, but I need her. So she is so disrespectful on the job. I was so torn apart. I was so angry that because, I mean, it was bad enough she did it to the employees. Mm -hmm. But you actually thought that you had the right <laughs> to do that to my family. You know what I mean? So when my sister called me, I was just mad. I was so mad. And I was like, can't wait to go to work the next day. I mean, I could barely sleep because all I wanted to do was go in there and give her a piece of my mind. So when I got to the job, I walked straight to her and I'm like, I need to speak to you. And she's like, what, what? I said, I need to speak to you for a minute. So she's like, what is it? I said, you called my mother's house yesterday looking for me because you wanted me to work, right? And she was like, yeah, I was off, right? She said, yeah, but I need you to come in. It doesn't matter. That number you got is an emergency contact number, right? She's like, yeah, why did you use it? This is not an emergency. I'm off, you know what I mean? This is not something that I have to do. So she was like, you know, she was mad because I was mad and I was kind of nasty with it because I was angry. But she just let me walk away, everything was fine. So I worked the next day, I worked the next day. Then it was like, I was off for the next two days. So I got a phone call in the morning. So when she called me, it was like, we got a problem. And I was like, what's the problem? She said, well, you left coffee pot and wanted, I mean, coffee in a coffee pot in a certain room. And I'm like, I don't remember doing that, you know, but like, whatever. And she's like, well, we're gonna have to dismiss you. So I actually got fired on my day off. And I'm like, where does that happen at? You know what I mean? Where does that happen at? But at the same time, I was real angry because there was nothing I could do about it. It wasn't a union job, you know what I mean? I was just terminated, so I'm thinking like, can't wait to go up there and get my check. I can't wait to go get it, because I'm going I'm going to like, I just was like, I was going to snatch her head off, I was going to do something. I said, I can't wait to go up there. So when I did go up there, it was like, okay, she heard I was in the building, she had me escorted out, okay, whatever happened. But at the same time, it's like, I've just never been so angry in my life because I'm a person that needs to have a voice. You know what I mean? And the fact is that I couldn't defend myself. You know what I mean? It was just like, okay, I was terminated. I was making this little bit of money. It was only $7.50 an hour. You know, I'm making this little bit of money. I have a mortgage. I don't have any income now. You know, because this person woke up in a bad, you know, place and because she's nasty and she's rude, she's disrespectful, she's prejudiced because I've only ever seen her do it to black people. You know, and it just like irked me to the fact that I'm not surprised it took six months to happen. I'm just surprised it took so long because I just knew that she was going to have her day with me. So my whole thing is, is that like for the work that I do now with the organizing and I'm knocking on people's doors and I'm hearing their stories. The problem is, is that that kind of thing, it, it happens all the time, all the time, all over the place. And how many hundreds of people lose their job? You know, behind the fact that somebody woke up in a bad way and or somebody doesn't like you and then you're out of a job and this job is the means to your survival. But now you're out of a job just because, you know, somebody's feeling a certain kind of way and, you know, and now your life is in a ruckus. You know what I mean? How am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to do this? And I just feel like it's unfair and that it needs to change. And what I found out is... Even with both jobs, you know, I still wasn't making enough. Um, so when the baseball season was over and it slowed down at Aramark, I would pick up extra hours at Target. I didn't complain about it, um, about the overtime, because I needed the money. But I still wasn't making enough. I had to work all the time just to pay my bills. Whenever I had free time, I would just sleep all day. I would need to use um, all my off time just to rest. <laughs> I had to struggle um, just to fit time in with my mom and my sister. I tried to have a social life, but it's just not possible working so much. I was always hopeful that I would have some kind of better future. A part of me felt like it would be, you know, I would have light at the end of the tunnel. But then another part of me felt like, you know, I was just a zombie. I was unsure what my future would bring. I worked so much because I wanted to be stable and independent. 
I wanted a stable relationship where I could build a life for myself and have a family. I knew nothing would be given to me unless I worked for it. You know, it takes a toll on your body um, when you're working like that. Um, not getting your proper rest, it wears on you. When I look at the guy that originally helped got me the job, um, you know, he was working both jobs. He ended up having a stroke and he doesn't work either job anymore. The thing that, um, the thing that drove me crazy about it was I worked so hard for seven years, but I was still working check to check. I was getting by, but it was still a struggle just to pay my bills. Um, so when, so when they said during contract negotiations at Aramark that these were just part-time jobs for pocket change, it, it made me really upset because that wasn't true for me. I kept that job since I was young. I got hired in 2003. I found out during negotiations that they didn't think we deserved what we got. I was angry and it made me want to get more involved. This level of poverty in the city of Philadelphia, 26%, uh, people living in poverty. Uh, when you have this level of people in deep poverty, 12% of the city of Philadelphia, uh, over uh, 180,000 people uh, that live in, live in poverty. You in, it's a state of emergency. You know what a state of emergency is. Uh, the mayor calls it every time there's a big snowstorm. Uh, they, they change the rules and laws that apply at, at during those times because we're in a state of emergency. People are expected to pitch in and help a little bit more because we're in a state of emergency. People are inconvenienced in their own goals and their own lives because, because we're in a state of emergency and everyone has to pitch in. In a state of emergency, everybody has to immediately focus all their energies and all their resources at the task at hand until that emergency is over. Uh, we don't focus on other things until the emergency is solved. And once the emergency is solved, only then can we go back to normal life. We've been living in a state of emergency in Philadelphia for so long, we think it's normal. <laughs> been, 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 been faced with this level of poverty so much for so many years uh, that, that it has, and has affected us in so many negative ways that what has been an emergency has become normal in our life or the, the normal level in our life and we have not even experienced what real normalcy is. So until uh, we start to act like it's a state of emergency, we'll, uh, that, it, only until then will other people start to act like it's emergency as well. And when we focus our time and our energy to say that this emergency has to end, it causes other people to act and move in the same way. So what this summit is trying to do is focus all our time and all our energy on solving this problem. And if we solve this problem, then it's unlikely that we'll have six shootings in one day and six people shot to death in the middle of our city because those young people don't have an opportunity to have a better life than what they do. And so all of the issues that we've been facing continually comes back to poverty, and racial justice. And until both of those two are solved, all the other issues will continue to manifest. I think, uh, uh, I think Fred, Frederick Douglass said it, if there's no struggle, there's no progress. And there's been a lot of struggle in Philadelphia for a long time. And I feel as though that now is time. It is time for us to take action. You know, I feel as though that we can't leave it in the hands of politicians. We can't leave it in the hands of the government. I feel as though that if we want change, it's something that we have to start right now in our neighborhoods and, and branch out from there. Because if we don't take it seriously, no one else will. So it obviously starts with us. And once they see that we're serious about it, more people will want to get involved. So I take it upon myself and I take it upon you that you guys get out in the streets, that you guys knock on your doors in your neighborhood, that you guys get involved in cleaning up your block because no one's going to do it for us, you know? So um, it starts with us and it ends with us.